Thank you, Lena, for that introduction. Um, so, so um, coral reefs obviously extend throughout the global oceans, and unfortunately, over 70% are currently estimated to be destroyed or threatened or degraded in some way. And this obviously represents a huge restoration undertaking, um, especially if we consider the Great Barrier Reef alone, which is over 250,000 square kilometers. And many people over the course of these last couple of days have talked about both the cost of different intervention methods as well as the extent of the impact that different intervention methods need to encompass to make a difference. And this um, points toward large scale interventions might be needed to have um, a real impact. So one of these interventions could be assisted gene flow as a way to build resilience into future warming. So as Carly already mentioned, um, the GBR varies in temperature across its breadth, where the northern regions are generally warmer than the central and the southern regions. And this means that if you collect larvae from the fourth, far north of the GBR um, and expose them to thermal stress, that they actually increase um, their likelihood of survival under thermal stress actually increases tenfold compared to central um, larvae. And that potentially sets up um, one scenario in which if you move individuals from the north, either adults or early life history stages, um, or even do reproductive crosses, um, potentially with warmer parents <coughs> crossed with cooler parents, um, you can essentially increase the um, climate uh, tolerance of those individuals in the southern and central regions. So that really sets up um, an aim of assisted gene flow, which is to improve the overall thermal tolerance of individuals in the central and the southern regions as um, the climate continues to warm. So assisted translocation really just describes the movement of organisms across their natural ranges. And this has been going on in the terrestrial literature for quite a long time. Um, the rhino on the top and the cockapoo in the in the bottom, and we recently did this, uh, as Carly mentioned, with GBR Legacy this last year, um, seen here with the corals on the plane. And when we think about different levels of translocation and think about their different risks, the risk really does increase as you move organisms outside of their known ranges. So I just want to highlight that assisted gene flow is within the known range of that organism. And um, potentially more notorious examples, like I mentioned yesterday with the cane toad example, those really represent assisted migration where you've taken organisms outside of their known local ranges and moving them into some place new. So um, we're really positioned really up in here where we're only at this point in time considering the movement of organisms within their known ranges. So, um, in order to understand assisted gene flow, we really need to quantify rates of fixation of genes. And so we can use um, ideas like genetic introgression to really get at some of these points. So in order to have genetic fixation, or the fixation of genes into populations, we need to consider biophysical connectivity. So where are those larvae going? Um, through currents, for example, up and down the GBR. Where do those larvae actually recruit to? Where is realized dispersal actually occurring? So once those larvae get places, are they reproducing with the local populations and actually um, becoming a part of the normal reproductive cycles? And then we can think of genetic fixation as incorporating each of these different levels to really understand and quantify the rates of the introgression of different genetic variants within populations. So for this talk today, I'm going to address uh, three questions across these different scales. One being, are larvae going south? So if larvae are more thermally tolerant in the north, do, can they, through biophysical channels, actually get to um, central and southern reefs? If they can, or if we can place them there, how long would it take for genetic variants to become established in central and southern regions? And finally, how many migrants, whether that be adults, larvae, or juveniles, would it take to actually create this genetic fixation at the central and southern populations? Um, so I just want to kind of clarify introgression a little bit more. So if we take this um, kind of theoretical population of 
different corals. The yellow coral here has a variant that's associated with increased thermal tolerance. So some gene, some SNP, that allows it to survive better compared to the other individuals when exposed to thermal stress. So through time, we can imagine maybe a selective event has occurred, bleaching, for example, and now that theoretical population, those allele frequencies have shifted, and now this um, thermal tolerance gene can be found in more individuals um, in, this, in these different populations. So in order to quantify how these variants move, we can think of them as moving through space and time like waves. So here is the theoretical variant um, at the top in time one, and it can be modeled just as a wave moving and interacting with other variants through time as well as through space. So we can quantify rates of change as well as the breadth of extent. So where are they going to go? Um, are there barriers to dispersal from the far north to um, the central and southern regions? So in order to answer this question, I used passive um, particle dispersal modeling and using TJU as um, kind of a dispersal point reef for, um, uh, for reasons already outlined by Carly um, and different um, parameters associated with Acropora broadcasting species during um, the spawning times. We can see with these light blue peaks, those are actually the highest probability of larvae being in those particular regions. So yes, if we just use one reef, in this case Tiju, they really aren't going very far north. They're getting a bit trapped up here. And this really makes sense given what we know about brooding species, um, which Greg Torta modeled in um, a paper in 2013, which he also showed that there's quite a lot of larval retention in the far north and there's high variability year to year. And so if we think about AGF, or assisted gene flow, as kind of a different method, we really need to be careful about where these um, potential variants are placed if we do want to um, increase their spread. So obviously, during spawning, multiple reefs are spawning at the same time. So if we scaled up to different reefs, um, whoops, it said that something would be wrong, and has. Um, so in the boxes here, essentially, it just outlines um, 15 other reefs that I chose. One being a reef that we know has um, thermal tolerance variants associated um, with heritability. Ten other reefs that had similar biophysical characteristics to Tiju Reef. And then three other reefs that have recently been um, published by Hock et al., which are three reefs that have very um, high dispersal, so they're really important reefs in the far north at um, essentially providing larvae to other parts of the GBR. So that's what is supposed to be there. Um, so those 15 reefs, if we do the same kind of passive dispersal modeling over replicate runs and similar parameters, um, again, there's some larvae that this time do manage to get south, um, but the, the gray shading here, which is uh, kind of hard to see, essentially shows that the highest probability peaks, again, are retained within the far north. So even if we use multiple reef release sites, they're still kind of trapped up in, in the far north. So, and this local retention um, really isn't surprising given the kind of biophysical models that have been put out, as well as the limited numbers of studies looking at gene flow across the GBR for <coughs> different broadcasting species. So, Okay, so they're not really getting that far, but say we place them in different places, how fast can we expect them to move? So um, this is really important because most of the time needed for adaptation actually occurs during genetic fixation. Um, and so to, in order to quantify this, I used the 2D stepping stone wave expansion model. And um, just to give you a bit of the parameters, um, some of them included selection coefficients, so different traits of different um, selection coefficients based on how important they are effective migration rates, species ranges, mutation rates, all of these things are incorporated. Um, so again, if we take Tiju Reef as kind of our center, epicenter of wave expansion, um, we can calculate the rate of spread um, across these different regions. And essentially, if we have one variant at a pretty high selective coefficient, um, which you would expect for thermal tolerance, um, you can estimate about a 0.029 kilometers per generation spread. And what that means is that, um, again, kind of looking at Tiju, it would
would take about 30 generations just to reach 1.7 kilometers, and alternatively, 100 generations to get to the next closest reef, which is about 5.8 kilometers. And if we scale that out um, to 500 and 1,000 generations, we're still relatively trapped within the far north of the GBR. And you might think, oh gosh, these estimates are really slow, um, but these are pretty in line with normal fixation rates for a number of different genes, because we really have to remember these kinds of processes usually occur over very long evolutionary time scales, and it's only recently that we're trying to, consent, to condense them into a very shorter time scale. So, to answer the question, how far are they going? Um, how fast are they going? Well, they're not going that far, and they're not going that fast. So that potentially um, suggests that um, uh, intervention might be needed if we want these variants to go to different places. So populations um, don't just exist as single individuals across uh, discrete populations. So we have, uh, say we imagine different populations across the reef, such as that, um, but then we really need to start estimating effective population sizes. So how many breeding individuals occur in each of these discrete populations, and can we incorporate that into our models to try to get a GBR-wide estimate of genetic fixation? So if we start to um, incorporate genetic fixation rates, on one reef it really starts to blow out um, the, the time to fixation. So now we're looking at about 46 generations um, to reach fixation. And only recently was there a paper to show across the GBR for different populations of Aquapora millipora that the effective breeding population size of at least this species is about 21,000 individuals. So we're going to have to again scale up, and this almost doubles the time to need, uh, the time we'll need to fixation. So given all of these rates that I've talked about, multiple release sites really are going to be needed in order to um, have genetic fixation on time scales that are needed and relevant for restoration. So finally, I just wanted to cover, well, how many migrants are we actually talking about? There's been a number of nice talks today looking at how many larvae we can get on boats, and how many can we settle, and how many can we have in CSIM, um, and, but how many could we actually need for genetic fixation? So, unfortunately, if too few migrants are used, fixation has a tendency to slide backward due to natural processes like genetic drift. And quite intuitively, we can decrease the time to fixation if we increase the number of migrants used. So if we, again, take our example of Tiju Reef, um, so looking at a single reef scenario again, under two different selection coefficients, both the teal as well as the purple, where the number of migrants that can be larvae, juveniles, or adults, are seen on the x-axis, and the generation time to genetic fixation is seen on the y. We can see that we need about 100 migrants, so those are individuals that are not only reaching the location, but are actually reproducing with individuals at the sink location, um, that genetic fixation should occur in about four generations. And if we up that to about 1,000 um, individuals, we can actually decrease that to less than one generation. So obviously we're interested in not just single reef scenarios, but across potentially the um, whole GBR or other reef tracks. So we can look at the number of reefs now, from zero to about 3,000, um, where the z-axis is the number of migrants and the y-axis is the, the log time to fixation in generations for particular variants, which corresponds with this um, color code over here. And what we can see is that the rates really start to explode. So it's going to take about 38 generations with at least 10,000 migrants to achieve genetic fixation um, across a full, the full extent of the GBR. So some take home messages. Without assistance, fixation of thermal tolerance is unlikely to spread beyond the far north of the GBR without some assistance. And two, if there are variants in the far north, which um, studies suggest that there are, um, it may take at least 30 generations just to leave one reef. And to kind of um, bring this, I guess, into perspective, using the IPCC report um, that has gone around um, in this uh, seminar, 32 years from now is 
the 2050 scenario. So essentially that would be one, that would be the amount of time for that variant to just leave one reef. And 82 years brings us, brings us to the um, 2100 scenario, which is the amount of time that that variant would need to get to the next closest reef. So there really isn't a lot of time. Um, and thirdly, if we're looking at single reef scenarios, um, it would take about a thousand individuals to reach fixation in three generations. And when we're talking about scales of the GBR, it's really going to take quite a lot of individuals, um, which I'm now convinced is possible given what CSIM hasn't planned, um, that it's really going to take a lot of individuals to have these thermal tolerance genes or whatever genes we're interested in become fixed naturally within populations. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you and um, open it up.